Hi, I'm Kirk. And I'm Brian. Have a holly jolly holiday. And And welcome welcome to Scandal Water. Where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy. And Ashley. Will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Stories and scandal water. It's where. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning. And happy holidays to our listeners. Yes. Yeah. So guys, just to fill you in, we are actually recording this before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. But if we stick true to our plans, this is going to come out to you guys the week leading into Christmas. And so we have something special planned. We do. Yeah, we're excited about this. So we're going to reveal what our special little surprise is here in mm-hmm. a few minutes, but let's just go ahead and do our normal intro sure. and see if maybe they can figure it out as we go along. Oh, they get to be the quiz takers this time. <laughs> all right, actually, I'm going to ask you, mm-hmm. one of the most famous works of all time, we've referenced it before, actually, a year ago, mm-hmm. is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Right. Have you seen it presented? I know you've seen movie versions, but I what have. is your experience with A Christmas Carol? Well, I saw, I've seen it as a one-man show. Oh. It was that was very interesting on on television. I think it was sometime last year, and I've seen the Muppet version of mm-hmm. it. And the thing I, I may have even said this last last time, but the thing about the Muppet version is that Michael Caine said he acted it as if it was a straight drama. Yes, I think you did bring that up. So that's <laughs> that's my exposure. I don't think that I've ever seen it actually as a play in person. Mm-hmm. I don't think. It's interesting because one of the bonuses of being an educator, more so in the past than now, because sadly, I think COVID has changed this, but we used Mm -hmm. to go to see A Christmas Carol performed at Actors Theater every single year for years on end as a seventh grade field trip. And so... (laughs) Not that you were in seventh grade, grade. (laughs) as I was fooled for most of the year last year, thinking you had an amazing eighth grade life. (laughs) Uh, that was funny. No, as someone who attended yes. the seventh grade as a chaperone, field trip, right? It got to the point to where I could actually compare one year to the next. Oh yeah, was it like, the same actors? Sometimes a lot of times it was. The okay. fellow who played Scrooge was the same many many times. He was amazing. But all that to say, I loved it. In fact, yeah. it, it became part of my Christmas um, tradition a, tradition or experience. Mm-hmm. It, it really added something. But one of the things I loved was the way Christmas was presented. How festive it felt, Mm -hmm. the happiness that the actors on stage would exude. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about you had the one scene where Scrooge would go visit his nephew Mm -hmm. while he was celebrating at his house and he had all the friends over. It was like a Christmas party. Nice. And then kind of contrasted against the Cratchits who were celebrating and they didn't have nearly the same wealth or the same benefits, the same things that to help them celebrate, but Mm -hmm. they had the same joy. Ah. Yeah. And so anyway, a few of the things, I'm going to ask you to jump in here too. Okay. A a few of the Christmas ideas or the Christmas traditions that came across through that work. I remember there was a big deal about bring us our figgy pudding. Mm -hmm. And there was also the idea of eating the meal together, the turkey, Mm -hmm. because the Cratchit family was kind of celebrating this turkey and Scrooge commented on how small it was, as mm. I recall. Okay. Are there any other gosh Christmas no. ideas that you remember? I just remember from seeing, well, I've also seen Scrooge with Bill Murray. So mm, maybe yes. that's the, I just remember the ghost, the ghost part of Christmas present being this big feast and this big mm-hmm. joyous occasion. And maybe that's where the two parties took place. Yes, I think it was. Okay. And then I remember the ghost of Christmas past being his, his past. Scrooge's mm-hmm. past and his lost love and all, all that kind of stuff. But it's been quite a while since I've, I've seen anything. Right. Well, that's interesting, though. I'm glad you took us to the ghost because mm-hmm. if I think about the Christmas that was represented through the ghost of Christmas past, mm-hmm. it was isolation. Like there mm-hmm. wasn't any feel of Christmas to mm-hmm. me. He was by himself, no family, no celebration, no joy, just a lot of loneliness. And then if we think about the ghost of Christmas future, mm-hmm. a lot of 
desolation yeah. and want and so it's almost bookended mm-hmm. his past and his future were very desolate and the present is what was joyful but it wasn't even his present it was the other people's present. right he was not part of their present no. Yes. Well, I asked this question because it's going to lead into, Mm -hmm. of course, our our little surprise that's coming up. If you're one of our longtime listeners and you were with us a year ago, you probably heard our episode on Christmas ghost stories. Yes. And at that time, in order to lead into that particular topic, we gave a little background on Charles Dickens and how he influenced the holiday of Christmas. And so you may hear a little repeat because some of this context is applicable again for this episode. Okay. So just bear in mind, some of this is going to sound a little familiar, but I'm also going to share some new things. Okay. Okay. So here we go. You may not know this. I didn't the first time I was researching this, but when Charles Dickens came along, which was in the year 1812, the tradition of Christmas was pretty much almost non-existent except Mm -hmm. in little pockets of England. There was an article that talked about Christmas and it referred to it as a second rate holiday in Mm -hmm. Great Britain. Mm -hmm. They pointed out that Easter was their main church holiday. Boxing Day was the main winter holiday Mm -hmm. and Christmas came in way behind both of them. In fact, they talked about that for most people, it was a work day. Right. I remember that. Yeah. They didn't think that this was a time to take off. It was considered unimportant and the workers didn't even complain because it wasn't, it wasn't a big day to them either. Right. Charles Dickens changed all of that with his Christmas Carol. Let me, let me preface that. He didn't change it single-handedly. There were other factors as well, which we're going to talk about, but his work, a Christmas Carol made a huge difference. In fact, there was a time magazine article that was literally titled how Charles Dickens, a Christmas Carol changed the way the holiday is celebrated. Interesting. Yeah. So he has given a lot of credit, but we're going to talk about some of those other factors here in a minute. But just as a review, Charles Dickens did not write a Christmas Carol just as a work of fiction, Mm -hmm. just as something that was solely meant to, to talk about Christmas and how we should act. It was a very pointed statement about society. Mm. He had an agenda with that. He was very concerned about the issues of poverty, child labor, the fact that they had no system to support the disabled. And a lot of that came from his own experiences Mm -hmm. because he was someone who was the victim, I guess you would call it, of child labor. He had just read a government report on child labor in the United Kingdom. And it was based on this compilation of interviews with children. It had been put together by a friend of his. Is, and he was absolutely appalled. He read the testimony of girls who sewed dresses for like 16 hours a day, six days a week. Mm. And that they think may have, you know, inspired some of Martha Cratchit's background okay. in that work. Okay. He read about an eight year old child who dragged coal carts through these tiny subterranean passages working for 11 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, these were just a few examples, and he saw them over and over again. He's- I remember seeing a YouTube video a long time ago talking about the child labor in mm-hmm. the UK specifically back back during that time, and that they would get little chimney sweeps that were five or six years old yes. that would get clean out the chimneys, and sometimes they get stuck in there, and, and they would die. And they didn't care. No. That was actually a point that came out mm-hmm. in my research, was that they treated these workers as as disposable. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't have the rights. They were not valued. It was absolutely appalling. And they said that this brutal reality, that was a phrase I took from an article, was the result of these revolutionary changes that had come about because of the Industrial Revolution. They said the population of England had grown 64% between the time of Dickens' birth in 1812 and the year of this child labor report. So all of these workers who needed money, who needed to try to live, had left the countryside. They were crowding into these new manufacturing centers. And again, they were treating these workers as though they were nothing more than an assembly line to them. They Mm. were just a way to get things put together, a way to make these, get these products put out so that they could make their money. Mm -hmm. And this was something that Charles Dickens himself had had to do. He, as a child, had had to work many, many hours day after day. And so he, he felt this, this was personal to him. Yeah. So he put together first the idea 
of writing a pamphlet that he was going to put out. It was supposed to be called An Appeal to the People of England on Behalf of the Poor Man's Child. But he decided about a week later that he wasn't going to get far with that. He was going to turn it into a story where he was going to really appeal to the emotions, especially Mm -hmm. pity and sympathy. Yep. Sometimes you can reach people more if you turn something true into fiction and you can appeal to the emotions. Yes, absolutely. So as we mentioned last time, he pitched his book and it did not go over well because the publishers didn't think anybody would be interested in his idea. They have reason for that. Right. Because for one thing... What's a big deal about Christmas? Yes, exactly. You didn't have a lot of people who were worried about this situation Mm -hmm. with children or the the system. And you also did not have a society where Christmas was a big deal. So there was not much to make them want to go for this. But he pushed hard and he even put up some of his own money. And he did, of course, (laughs) manage to get them to publish this. But as we said before, one of the factors that helped with his argument was that Queen Victoria had recently married the German Prince Albert. And she brought in Christmas trees, right? Yep. Because Albert one. Albert had those, so they brought in the, the concept of a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. And then they put candles on it. That's not, Which that's makes no sense. Fire hazard. It looked pretty, though. It did, but that's a fire <laughs> hazard. He saw that there was beginning to be this renewed interest in Christmas. He was able to use that to help convince these people, and the book was published mm-hmm. on December 19th, 1843. And as we know, of course, it is now the most famous Christmas story of all time. That's crazy. And it's been remade so many times. So- Oh, many. so many places. It's just unbelievable. But his play is not, it was a book originally. I keep using the term play because that's how I know it. But mm-hmm. it was a book and then, of course, turned did into he turn a play. It, did he turn it into a play or did somebody else? Do you know? I don't know, although I did see an article today that talked about his coming to America and performing it himself. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah, years later and how amazing it was. I bet, because he would know exactly what he wanted it to sound like. Yeah, they said he was an amazing performer. Ooh, Mm -hmm. was it a one-man show when he did it? I believe it was. I think he came in and did all these different voices. Wow. And said it was just a showstopper. Man, I wish we could have had film back then to see that. Mm -hmm. So in addition to A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens helped to really promote Christmas through other works that he did. As we've mentioned before, he had those weekly magazines, House Sold Words was the first one. And then when it kind of stopped, he picked up with one called All the Year Round. And between the two of those, they were in distribution between the years of 1850 to 1867. Mm. And he was the publisher and editor and also one of the biggest contributors. Sounds like he was the first blogger. (laughs) <laughs> that's a blog probably is a good accurate description but he had of course special christmas editions mm-hmm. that's where the ghost stories would often uh, come out yes. but the point is they were centered around christmas mm-hmm. and so that was yet another thing that really helped to promote the holiday of christmas now let's talk about some of these other factors beyond charles dickens we said before the 19th century businesses they were looking for a new holiday that they could commercialize so they were ripened that way. We had Mm -hmm. the Industrial Revolution was happening, so you had a lot of technology, a lot of advancements there. That contributed to this. And then the Christmas card. Now, I shared a tiny bit about the Christmas card last time, but I've got some new information. Okay. In 1843, which was actually the exact same year that A Christmas Carol came out, a man named Henry Cole commissioned an artist to design a card for Christmas. Now, what I had told you guys last time was that it was a habit, apparently, around Christmas for people to have to sit down and write these long letters. Yeah, to say what's up in my life. mm -hmm, And it got old. They were not super excited about that. Because you'd have to recopy it. It's like, who do I want to tell about my life this year? So it gets smaller and smaller every time. (laughs) The last one. Doing great. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But in this instance, this fella had commissioned an artist to create the design and the illustration showed this group of people around a dinner table and it had a Christmas message. Well, this was an expensive card, this original one. It cost a shilling for each one and they were really pricey for the ordinary Victorian person to buy. So not a lot of people got that particular version, Mm -hmm. but it raised the interest and a lot of parents started encouraging their children and Queen Victoria's kids were included in this Mm -hmm. to start making their own Christmas cards. Okay. And then in this age of the industrial revolution, this color printing technology came out and they used that to start producing these Christmas cards, the price dropped, and then the price of postage dropped, and all of a sudden the Christmas card industry had taken off. And they said Mm. by the 1880s, 
holidays, sending Christmas cards had become a hugely popular tradition. Wow. And it was also very lucrative. They produced 11.5 million cards in 1880 alone. What? Yeah. So this was another thing that really helped Christmas take off. Yeah. And then another point was... We call it, a lot of times we reference it as a Dickens Christmas. We'll think about it that way yeah. because his works were so widespread. Yeah. We saw the production so many times. And so we started to think about Christmas through the way that Charles Dickens portrayed it in his writing. But really, when we think about a Dickens Christmas, we're thinking about a Victorian Christmas. Oh. We're thinking about Christmas the way it was yeah. during the years that Queen Victoria was reigning. Mm -hmm. Which was a long time. So to offer a few changes that came about either because she and her family started spreading their traditions or during her reign, some of these changes were happening with the arts or commercialization or technology. Could be any and all of those, but here are a few things that came about in terms of the Victorian Christmas. It was during her reign that they came out with something called, I want to I know if you know what this is. Okay. Okay. So Ashley, have you ever heard of a Christmas cracker? No, but if I had to guess, it would either be something that makes noise or like a firecracker. It does make noise. Okay. And apparently it is a really huge thing in England. No kidding. Yes. Which... I looked it up because not being familiar with it, sure. I, I looked up to see, is this still something mm -hmm. that people use or, or put in their celebrations today? Mm -hmm. And it appears that it is. No kidding. Yes. But it started in 1848 during this Victorian uh -huh. time, a British confectioner named Tom Smith invented this new way to sell sweets. He was inspired by a trip to Paris where he saw bonbons, which are sugared almonds wrapped in twists of paper, apparently. Never had one of those either. No, I think of them as ice cream. Bonbons oh, are ice cream. That's like chocolate and little, um, yeah, like a little The nugget. chocolate covered, I ha yeah. I've seen those. Mm -hmm. Never had one of those either, but that sounds delightful. Mm -hmm. Well, but he saw these bonbons in Paris and he came up with the idea of the Christmas cracker, which is a simple package filled with sweets that snap when pulled apart. Oh. And then over time, apparently, sometimes people would replace the sweets with small gifts or paper hats in the late Victorian period. And it says this is something that is still part of the modern Christmas tradition. Very cool. Yeah, not over here, but yeah. So another thing that came about in terms of Christmas during this Victorian time was they changed the way you decorated your house. Mm -hmm. It became much more elaborate. They shared that it was a medieval tradition of using evergreens. That's mm -hmm. been around forever. Mm -hmm. But the way you place them, where you place them became way more important during this time. Where you place them? Mm -hmm. Like over the mantle and stuff? I didn't get a lot of the details. Okay. But here, here's a sentence from this article. The old custom of simply decking walls and windows with sprigs and twigs was sniffed at. Mm. More elegant elegance was encouraged. Okay. So they wanted to deck the halls. They, apparently there falling. was a way to do it. <laughs> An 1881 article in Castle's Family Magazine gave directions to the lady of the house. Oh, Here's a quote from that. Okay. To bring about a general feeling of enjoyment, much depends on the surroundings. It is worthwhile to bestow some little trouble on the decoration of the rooms. Oh, okay. Yeah, so bear that in mind, Ashley. A little trouble. <laughs> a little trouble. A little trouble. Look at my look at my rooms. There's a, there's very little trouble around here. <laughs> you know this one, I'm sure. Okay. When to give gifts changed. When did they used to oh, give? Oh, New Year's. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Henry VIII and all of them, that's where I learned about it, is Henry VIII, Henry VIII's court used to give gifts at New Year's Eve. It apparently was a big tradition, mm -hmm. but as Christmas became more important to the Victorians, they decided to start giving some at Christmas. I would like to go back to New Year's Eve so that I can catch all the sales of the after <laughs> Christmas. You know that they would change that. I know, I know. But within my friend group, let's, right. let's change it, everybody. Let's go back to the old, I'm going to be like, it's olden days. No, we're going to get... Day after Christmas sales. Well, <laughs> uh, in the beginning, the gifts were really modest, yes. fruit, nuts, sweets, handmade little trinkets. And then, of course, over time, as Christmas really caught on and things grew in size, all of a sudden the gifts became More bigger. More expensive. I think bought. Anne wrote Henry VIII. It wasn't Anne. It was the daughter, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth wrote him a poem. That was Aww, his gift. Nice. Like, love me, dad. I love you. Mm, That's me well, summing it up. Not nice, but sad. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The Christmas feast that we've mentioned a few times also dated back to the Middle Ages, but it changed during the Victorian period as well. Mm -hmm. They said, for, they gave one example. Apparently, a long time ago, mince pies were 
made from meat that went all the way back to Henry VIII's mm-hmm. times. Men's meat pies is what I think it used mm-hmm. to be called. Yeah. But they said during the 19th century, there was a revolution in the composition of the dish and mixes without meat began to be popular hmm. in certain I don't societies. think I've ever had any kind of mince meat. I don't or even mince know what pie. it is. Boy, we're really lacking in our English knowledge. <laughs> I'm ashamed of us to be as Anglophile as I am. Just a few more. Roast turkey had its beginnings in Victorian Britain. They said before this, beef and goose were very common for Christmas dinner, but turkey was added by the more wealthy people in the 19th century because it's the perfect size for a middle-class family gathering. Okay. Mm-hmm. Carols were also not new, but during this time period, the tradition of caroling was actively revived and popularized. Okay. They said that Victorians thought that carols were delightful and they were a wonderful form of entertainment. And so they really pushed this. They would sometimes put old words to new tunes. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of cool. The first significant collection of carols was published in 1833. Wow. That Mm -hmm. is so long ago, but not. Yeah. And then one last note. The Victorians really, really placed an emphasis on family being at the center of the Christmas celebration. Preparing the meal, eating it together, Mm -hmm. decorations, the gift giving. And they specifically mention, which is something we noticed in A Christmas Carol, parlor games, Mm -hmm. entertainment, doing things together as a family. Mm -hmm. Those were all very essential ways to celebrate. It was about bonding. Yes. And try to involve that whole family. Okay. So that was a big deal. So those are a few highlights, guys, of what a Victorian Christmas or a Dickens Christmas might look like, Mm -hmm. just to kind of name some of those elements. Charles Dickens died of a stroke in 1870. He was only 58. Queen Victoria. I know. I didn't really remember that. But Queen Victoria passed away at age 81 in 1901. We've You know why I know that? Mary Poppins is why I know that. Because he says, Mr. Banks, when he's coming home, he says, King Edward's on the throne. It's the age of men. And it was 1901. Ah. That's how I remember when she died. Wow. I would never have picked up on that. Yep. We've, of course, talked about how both of those people had a huge impact on the Christmas holiday. And it's kind of cool that they got to see the impact during their lifetimes Mm -hmm. because... As we said, at Charles Dickens' birth, Christmas was almost a non-tradition, you know, a non-holiday. Him and Victoria really changed that up. Mm -hmm. They said by the end of the 1800s, Christmas had now grown to be the biggest annual celebration that people celebrated every year. And the form of it had grown to to be very similar to what we recognize today. Today. Mm. Yeah. So to end with one last quote, while Charles Dickens did not invent the Victorian Christmas, his book, A Christmas Carol, is credited with helping to popularize and spread the traditions of the festival. Its themes of family, charity, goodwill, peace, and happiness encapsulate the spirit of the Victorian Christmas and are very much a part of the Christmas we celebrate today. See, one person can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, Mm -hmm. for our special treat, Ashley and I decided we are taking a field trip. Yes, we are. (laughs) So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break, but when we come back from the break... We're going to time travel to the future. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You're going to be with us as we are there. On the spot reporting. That's right. To go back to my WK RP guy, Mr. Les Nessman. We're going to be Les Nessman on the spot. <laughs> so come back and join us because we're about to have a Dickens of a good time. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> So here we are on our field trip. It is a candlelight tour of the Conrad Caldwell Museum, which is, it's this house that has been preserved. It was owned by the original family, the Conrads, then sold to the Caldwells, and it's actually had a few other owners in between. But basically, this is a home that is set up to show what a Dickens slash Victorian Christmas would be like. And we are here with Brian and Kirk taking our candlelight tour and enjoying a very Dickens Christmas. And we want to tell you our impressions. Yes. So we just did the first floor. Yes, we did. And it was a little noisy down there. So they said we could record up here on the second floor. And what do you think of the first floor? First thing that stuck out to me, the stairwell. 
Uh, right? Yes. I can't get over how ornate everything is. I'm sure that this is not the best comparison, but I think of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. I think of the pictures of like the stairwell in the Titanic and how everything was just so over the top, gorgeous, the rich wood tones and everything so elaborately carved and everything so tall. And that's what I see everywhere I look here. Just beautiful artistry. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what were your impressions? What you said. I think the the stairwell, the fact that... What was the saying that the, the first curator told us? If you saw something that was pretty, you wanted to make it beautiful. Victorians just love to make everything more ornate, more gorgeous. And that that's what this is. You mm -hmm. walk in and you're just like, my goodness. It's sort of like, you know, Brian and I have been to the Biltmore several times. It's like a little sister mm -hmm. to the Biltmore. What do you think, Brian? Do you want to talk? I like walking through looking at all of the architecture, but... I tend to focus when when you ladies are like looking at the pictures and the portraits and mm -hmm. and reading all the little cards about what where the hats and all the furniture and all that comes from. I'm looking at the radiators mm -hmm. and and the structure of the building, trying to figure out how this stone. I mean, if you tried to build this today, are there even quarries today that mine this and make this stone? If I was try if I was Elon Musk rich. Mm -hmm. What, what what would I build, and are there even places they can make this stuff anymore? I don't know. I tend to do a little bit more. I mean, I do admire all the things you guys mentioned, the intricate woodworking, the stone, all of it, the, the high ceilings. Uh, it's amazing, but I tend to find myself do a little bit more of a time travel when I'm at places like this and think, what would it have been like to really have walked in, and this was your room, and, and these would have been real candles burning, and... You know, you would have had to have that fireplace going to stay warm. And right. just um, what would that lifestyle have been like? And, of course, none of us would have lived this kind of lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. right? Had we been back in that time, yeah. we'd have been in a little cabin somewhere or something. We'd have been in this kind of room. <laughs> yeah, it, We're in the housekeeper's room right now. And this right. is where we would have been. <laughs> but even the housekeeper has 12-foot, yeah, like nice. 10-foot ceilings. One thing that stands out to me is what a wonderful job they've done preserving this place. One of the volunteers here shared that it's never really fallen into disrepair, that they've managed to basically maintain it even through the different owners, which I think is a blessing, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about all the craftsmanship that's gone into it, because they shared with us all the different master artists that have worked on this, which we'll, we'll share, I'm sure, a little bit of that later. But all that to say, it sounds to me like the people who are running this place are doing such a nice job with detail. For example, they shared with us that right now in the dining room, they have it set to represent the way it really would have looked back when one of the original owners had it because they found one of the old newspapers back in the day when they would have all the social information. They had literally described this lady's, was it Mrs. Caldwell, I, I think? think it, I think it was, it was Caldwell. Caldwell. The, the way her table was set, and they used that newspaper to actually recreate it as best they could so that it would really represent mm -hmm. the, the way it looked in this Victorian Christmas. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the kind of details that I really appreciate. I like it too. Hey everyone, this is Editor Ashley, and I just wanted to pop in here to let you all know that we already said that we couldn't record on the first floor because of all the music, but at the end of the evening, we stepped outside and asked one of the curators named Linda to tell us about this gorgeous painting that is on the stairwell. So what you're going to hear next through the magic of editing is her commentary on the first floor painting and then you're going to hear us on floors two and three talking to some of the curators and giving our impressions of the second and third floor in real time so i hope you enjoy it my name is linda shaw the painting on the wall has been on the wall since 1899 it was commissioned by mr conrad as a gift for his wife marie the painting is of isola bella like maggiore in italy and he commissioned it as a gift for a, for a special occasion. We don't know what that occasion was, but we think it was probably for an anniversary because that's where they honeymoon on Isola Bella. And it has been on the wall since 1899. There is a portion of the painting that has kind of dry rotted, and we've pulled it back and looked underneath, and you can actually see the original wallpaper from 1899. I'm Jim Brooks. The room we're in right now is, is, is the sitting room, and it would be what we would think of as a, a family room or a, a living room today where, where the family might gather. This room was used by the family for whatever families did at the turn of the century, which read, play cards, that type of thing. It was not used 
for guests. Guests were entertained on the first floor. Uh, guests would not have come to the second floor. This was a family area. So what we have here is, is pretty representative of, of how it would have been back in the day and, and at Christmas time. The fireplace, of course, it's, it's, it's very pretty right now. It's got the, the lights on it. And the home had electricity when it was built. So it's not that the electricity is something that's special, but they didn't have bright Christmas lights, I'm sure. And they would have relied on candles and, and artificial greenery, which is quite pretty today, gives you an idea of how it might have looked. But back in the turn of the century, it would have been real greenery, and there's a certain risk with fires and that type of thing. So probably we decorate more today than the, the Victorians did. And are those Christmas cards? The Christmas cards are, are period Christmas cards. I don't know too much about the cards. Uh, I've read them, but I think these are cards that the Caldwells have collected over the years and are, are just shown as, as, again, representative of, of what people would have distributed at the time. Mm. It's a nice room. The poor gentleman did only live in the home for about 10 years, and then the home was sold to uh, the Caldwell family, who brought, a, who brought a family here to live. It was just originally... Mr. Conrad and his wife, two people, lived in the home. So it's uh, the home ended up with a family then. She spent a great deal of her time doing a uh, little volunteer work, philanthropy, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So she was very, this is That's her, her painting, her, right? Her, her, her photograph. So this was her room. This room is, I mean, it's nice, it's beautiful now. In the, in the daytime, in the sunshine, this room is gorgeous. I mean, it just mm -hmm. lights up with sunshine. I like the wallpaper, too. Some of the pieces of furniture are original to the home. I know that one is for a fact. And because it's so similar and it's designed to that piece, that one probably is too. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Presbyterian uh, group had the home, furniture left, went with family, and has now returned. The family has turned it back to the home as museum pieces, which is good for them. Mm -hmm. Other pieces that may not be original to the home or the, they are they are very representative of the turn of the century period. What about the Florida de lis Was that that was a popular that, symbol? Uh, Florida de lis are all over Old Louisville, and and there's a lot. Just all the ones on the staircase coming up, and you hear in the stained and that stained glass. Florida de lis are everywhere in Old Louisville. Okay. Everywhere. Well, of course, you know the the French. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The French and, King Louis and all that stuff. You yeah, have to read about that. I can't tell you about that. <laughs> this house was built when? We had 1891, 1892. It took a while to build it. Oh, and yeah. Vanderbilt's was built? 1895. Was, okay. the, was a dumbwaiter common, or was that a special thing in this house? No, no, no. I think that's, that would have been special. We just now came to the third floor, and we're going to leave this running and give you all our impressions of this floor, because they said it's really beautiful. And look at this. This is a shower. I would not have expected this. Right off the stairwell. And look how big it is. I know. <laughs> I would have expected it to be a little less fancy up here. Yeah. No, they kept nice. it going. Yeah. Ooh, this is the billiard room. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Candy, look at this. Oh. Oh, this is gorgeous. Yeah. So the ceiling, the best I can describe it, it's like 3D. There mm -hmm. is... Almost looks like a, a chain link, 3D ceiling. But it's woodwork, right? I can't tell. It's dark. Can you it, tell? It looks to me. Brian, does it look like wood to you? Like it's carved? Well, well, it looks like it. But everywhere that I've gone and thought it was woodwork, when I got up into it, it's plaster work. Oh. Like when you go to the schools that have those old auditoriums, oh. and you look up and see those wooden beams when you go up in the attic above it. That's not wood. It, right. You can see the wire mesh, uh -huh. and it's all smoke. So I, I'm inclined to think that with the curves. Yeah. So yeah. they said that they would bring, after dinner, they would bring the gentleman up here to the billiard room, and we're looking at a billiard table, but it is just so opulent. Really and there's is. a stone fireplace, and it looks like we've got one, two, three, four windows looking out onto the street. Mm -hmm. And there's a tea set over in the corner, a huge Christmas tree, a birdcage, a, a Victorian-looking couch. This whole wall this, is nothing but woodwork. Yeah. It makes me think of, I know this is ridiculous, but like Beauty and the Beast, 
when you like see someplace like Gaston would have yeah, would have hung the tavern. Out. Yes, mm-hmm. because it really has this look of a very very rich manly men manly. Ta- I don't know. Um, the stone fireplace really makes it look like Gaston's tavern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is gorgeous. There's a balcony. Of course there is. And there's a card table. Oh, okay. So I thought it was a tea set, but when I walked over here, it's a card table. And this is, you have stairs built into it so that then your doors just open and you go right out. Man. Wow. (laughs) This is, I bet this is his office. I bet it is. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you? Very good. Uh, I'm, my name's Keith. This room was uh, built, well, originally was Mr. Conrad, the builder of the house. This was his office. And it's the only room that has an inlaid floor because Mrs. Conrad wanted him to be able to impress people when they came to see him here on business. Mm-hmm. It is impressive. It is. But if Mr. Conrad came back from his grave, the floor would be the only thing he'd recognize oh. here. The rest of the room was the creation of Walter Caldwell, the son of our second owner. He took this as a bedroom. And much like his parents, he loved the Gothic or Tudor look they had found in England. And so he made over the room to reflect that. Mm -hmm. They replaced the fireplace and mantle. They put in the ceiling beams, put in this wainscoting, and had these windows made over in Europe. They're all leaded glass, but they're not stained glass. They're hand-painted. So when you consider the house as a whole, how much of it would you say has a Victorian look versus a Tudor or a different style now? The only real Tudor look we would find would be in the library where they made the change with the fireplace and mantle there. And this room and the what was the ballroom that became a billiards room. Oh, so we were in the ballroom. Oh, okay. yes. That explains why it was so gorgeous. Yes. yes. Okay. But both of the, those three spaces, the only really thing places where they had a, a deliberate attempt to have a Tudor look. What is in the ceiling in the billiard room? What's that made of? Is that wood? Or? It's plaster to our knowledge. Okay. He thought that. And it's a stod building. After many years, I still can't figure out how to describe it to anyone mm-hmm. because the design doesn't fit anything yeah. you can think of. It's it, not the Greek key design it or like anything like that. a chain link almost. Yes. But even the other thing where you have kind of circular areas and then sure not try, quite rectangles, mm-hmm. almost like an emerald mm-hmm. cut, but an odd design and it was all the Caldwell's doing. What's your favorite room on this floor? Probably this room. Yeah. And it's set up as an office even though... The basic look of the room was created as when this became a bedroom, not an office. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually have photos of what this room or the other rooms on the third floor looked like for the Conrads. Mm -hmm. We have photos for much of the rest of the house prior to the Caldwells making their changes here. But these spaces, we or just have to be left to our imagination. Mm -hmm. So just for clarity, even though there have been owners since, you guys, when when the museum took over and recreated this, you took it back to either the way it looked when the Caldwells were here or the Conrads whenever possible? No, not definitely not to the Conrads at all. Oh, um, oh, and that's because of the physical changes the Caldwells made. Okay. We can't go backwards. Mm-hmm. And so rather than that, we like to tell people that you're not here in 1895, which is when the house was completed. Imagine you're here around 1908 okay. after the Caldwells have made their changes. Okay. Because, of course, by the time they bought the house in 1905, the Victorian period was already over. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted to make changes that reflected the more modern design ethic. And one of those, uh, a primary thing we would have found on the first and second floors was wallpaper on ceilings. Oh. And certainly by 1905, that was gone, that oh, style. Okay. So that was one of the changes they made. But also, we're fortunate that uh, the Caldwells used a local design firm here in Louisville, Bittners, which has been around since 1854. They're still in business. And they have kept records of virtually every customer they've ever had. Wow. And in 1992, we became a museum in 1987. That's when our foundation obtained the property. In 1992, we were a project house for the Junior League here in Louisville. And they partnered with Bittners. And all the wallpaper you see in the house, the paint that was done, that was all done at that time in 1992. And we're fairly confident, based on Bittners' records, that the look you've seen in the wallpaper throughout the house is pretty true to the look the Caldwells were trying for. Mm -hmm. It's all reproduction, but based on Bittner's records, we are sure it's fairly close to the look in color and style that the Caldwells were trying for. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason for us to tell you 
imagine it's more like 1908 because okay. it's been put back to what they had. Edwardian. Yes. Why do we have Mickey ears? <laughs> Well, the Caldwell Tank Company is the business that Walt, William Caldwell started, which is where he made his fortune. Uh -huh. He built water tanks and towers. Okay. On the table are representations of different things they've been able to make over the years. So, for example, the tank with the mouse ears was made for Disney down at Orlando mm -hmm. for uh, Walt Disney World. You'll notice a bourbon bottle depicted there. That was... a uh, tank that was put on top of Brown Foreman's uh, mm -hmm. headquarters here. It's about a mile west of us. There is a ketchup bottle there. Brooks Ketchup has a plant in southern Illinois in Collinsville, which is just north of St. Louis. And uh, you'll notice the baseball bat leaning there against the Louisville Slugger Museum. The Caldwell Tank Company built that to hide really? the heating and air conditioning vents to the building when it was converted into the Slugger Museum. Interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. The detail in windows mm -hmm. and window seats, I mean, just, it's amazing. You can just pick one feature I know. and be amazed by what you notice. It's just gorgeous. So how many rooms? We've got the billiard room. We've done this room. What other rooms do we have up here? Well, we, we thought the, the shower was nice. <laughs> well, now that was, the shower was added by the Presbyterian Church. Ah. The bathroom itself was built by the Caldwells. When they bought the house and their two children decided to use these rooms as bedrooms... Oh, is this Grace's room? Yes, then? it is. Okay. Their father realized he needed to add a bathroom to this level of the mm -hmm. house and built that. So that was completed around 1907. The shower stall was put in by the church and they removed the tub that was in there originally. Uh -huh. They had a house full of elderly women living here. It was much easier to use a shower than to climb in and out of the tub. Mm -hmm. But everything else in there, the rest of the floor and wall tile, the toilet sink and uh, medicine cabinet, it's all original back to 1907. This had been uh, Mr. Conrad's assistant's office when he was still living here and operating his business out of the house. And when the Caldwell children decided to have bedrooms up here, Grace chose this room. Uh -huh. It's smaller than some of the other rooms in the house, but still a nice space. But it needed to be dressed up for her. So her father added the molding around the ceiling. And this is actually Grace's furniture that she used in the house. So this was her bed. It's kind of like a little day bed. It is. It is. And the linens on it are her original. You can see her initials. Aww. The dressing table and the desk are also her original items. And of course, as you can see, given that it's a small room with this furniture, even the few pieces, there's no space for a wardrobe or an armoire here. Mm -hmm. So in what had been shelving space when it was the assistant's office, her father had a couple of wardrobes built into the wall on Very either nice. side of the fireplace. What is your favorite design element from the earlier years like do you like the crown molding do you like the floors what do you think well, it's hard to, it's hard not to choose the floors yeah uh, because they're so interesting and different mm -hmm. um a house full uh well at least first floor and second floor rooms full of american quilt pattern floors is different right off the bat but probably the, the carving on the first floor, the, the fleur-de-lis and other detail work that the master carpenters did here is probably the, the single feature that's uh, most interesting or what I think is the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the detail work is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I like how they, they do this in the Biltmore too. They hang the pictures. They don't do nails, they right. hang it from. Well, and that's, well, when you have plaster and lathe walls, if you try to hammer a uh, nail in there, you're going to crack the plaster in yeah. most cases and need to repair it. Yeah. Today we can use a drill and just drill a hole and put a screw in without much trouble, but for them it was a problem. So most homes of this era, they would have the picture rail up there and hang everything but off. But then you can it. move it pretty easily too. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a cool thing. They were one of the only people that had a car. Oh. It says on this picture that the Caldwells owned one of the few cars in Louisville. Only a few people knew how to drive them or fix them. So one time when they were on a trip to Wisconsin, they broke down over halfway there and had to send back to Louisville for a mechanic to fix it. Wow. Huh. Isn't that crazy? But look at the house standing there with yeah. nothing around it. Oh, wow. None of these other old houses around it. I will say the thing about the car, it seems odd that they'd be between somewhere here, between here in Wisconsin or even Chicago and need to send back for a mechanic here. But that particular type of automobile, the white uh, automobile from that era, was a steam-powered automobile. 
automobile. Oh. So it had a steam chamber. I'm not even sure how they created the steam, whether they had a coal-fired burner in there or what, but that's probably why they needed a special mechanic because not everyone would know how to fix the steam boiler. Right. Apparently that model car, you also had to start the car and start heating it up about 20 minutes before you actually wanted to drive it somewhere mm -hmm. so that it had enough steam to actually power the vehicle. Wow. Do you know anything, when, when we were looking at touring just these houses in general, I did not realize that Louisville is the largest congestion of Victorian homes in America. Yes. Do you know this anything about that? Well, old Louisville, this is uh -huh. all... If you had come here in the 1850s... Now, of course, the Victorian period runs from 1830 to 1900, roughly, so it's a mm -hmm. long time, right? Mm -hmm. The wealthy district was, in the 1850s and 1860s, was close, right downtown. Do you know where the Brown Hotel is, around 4th and Broadway? Mm -hmm. That was more or less the center of where the wealthy district was. Today, you're really only going to find a few mansions left down there. One of them is the Brennan House on 5th Street, just north of uh, Broadway. That's where you would have found the clustering of all those mansions. But in the 1870s, people started to move southward. And so they came this direction because they found larger lots. They could build even bigger homes. And so from anywhere south of there, let's say from Kentucky Avenue in particular, southward all the way down to where the university is, and then from Brook or Floyd Street all the way to 7th, that's just one unbroken area of Victorian area, excuse me, era homes mm. that is still intact. Thank you so much. Yes. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. When the family discusses this specific room, they only ever refer to this as Katie's bedroom. And Katie was the head housekeeper here in the home. So in every single family letter that we have, this space is only ever Katie's room. And of course the kids were kids, teenagers. And so like Grace's husband, before they were married, he would write letters saying, oh, when we're married, we don't have to sneak off to Katie's room to steal <laughs> kisses, kisses with one another. Oh. Um, so Katie was also a friend and a confidant between a lot of the family members. So it was just, it was just great. So she lived with the family for years? This years. Was, I mean, a long time. Oh, yes. Yeah. They refer to her quite often in all the family letters. And when Katie retired from service here in the home, Mr. Caldwell actually gave her shares of the Caldwell Tank Company so that she would be well taken care of later in her life. So that way she never had to worry about anything. Very nice. So, so if you are interested in coming to see the Candlelight Tour yourself, you have one more opportunity. They have another showing, another um, time that you can reserve on December 22nd. But of course... This is a beautiful home that you can come visit anytime. In fact, we have the director, Chris, with us right now, and we've asked him to briefly share with us some of the information about how you could come visit. So the Conrad Caldwell House is open for tours, both guided and self-guided, Thursday through Sunday. We offer guided tours at 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. and self-guided tours from noon until 2.30. You can purchase tickets on our website or you can come to the museum and purchase them in person in our gift shop and Welcome Center. If you could tell people in 30 seconds or less why they should come here, what would you say? The Conrad Caldwell House is the finest example of domestic Richardsonian Romanesque architecture in the city of Louisville. Because we're in the holiday season, Theophilus Conrad, the original owner of the home, always referred to this house as an ornament to the city. So it's perfect for the holiday season. It's the ornament on Louisville's Christmas tree, one of them. And it is a really great deep dive into what life was like here in Louisville's Gilded Age. So she and I have kind of referred to it as a Victorian Christmas. Would mm -hmm. you say that? That's semi-accurate because we've heard them talk it's more Edwardian than Victorian. Yeah, a lot of Christmas traditions from the Victorian period definitely carried into the Edwardian period. Mm -hmm. So you're not wrong if you make a reference to the Victorian era in the time that this house was primarily occupied in the Edwardian period because a lot of those traditions still transferred over to that time period. So we're kind of right in the middle between the Victorian and the Edwardian. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you all so much. Ashley, this was a really fun way to celebrate Christmas together and to, to take a field trip that I think was something different and also just something really fun for the holidays. And we got Brian and Kirk involved. I know. How fun was that? And the Conrad Caldwell House, I mean, how 
beautiful was that. I just just love this. Yes, I thought it was so fun. And please, if you have a chance, if you're in this area, do go by and see this place because it is just, I don't think that we've done it service with what we've been talking about, but you've heard the curators, which they were so kind to give us those sound bites, mm -hmm. but it really is something that you need to see in person to just enjoy it. Absolutely. I really do think it's kind of added something to my holiday season to, to get to experience Christmas through that house and getting to, to talk to people and just, I don't know, experience history that way, which brings to mind that I think this would be a wonderful time for us to wish our listeners a happy holidays and a very Merry Christmas. Yes, thank you guys for listening to us. Thank you for allowing us to do what we love. Mm -hmm. And we can never do these field trips if there weren't people interested in, in history like we are. And it's just, I can't believe that we get to do this still every week. We appreciate you more than you know, and we wish you the very best holiday season ever. Cheers to you, our listeners. Cheers. If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can Join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music, Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reith, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the hosts during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.